Remembering where we were even just a couple of months ago with $22 silver, certainly a good indication, especially that it has kept popping back up above that $30 mark. Well, hello there, my friends. Chris Marcus here with you for Arcady Economics on what has already become a pretty exciting day in the markets because as we will dig into in a moment, we had CPI out earlier this morning. And also, depending on your, when you're watching this, we may have Jerome Powell and the Fed announcement come and press conference coming out shortly. So in addition to that, also some news from the BRICS and a whole lot more. So let us get started by first taking a quick look at the silver price, which, as you can see quite nicely there, <clears throat> Back above $30 as you had that spike up right after the CPI report came out, which if we take a quick look into that, uh, you will see that came in a little bit less than expected. The headline CPI was flat in May, 3.3% from a year ago. Both of those coming in a tenth of a percentage point below market expectations. And then in the core CPI, it was up 0.2% over the month, 3.4% from a year ago. And both of those were also a tenth of a percent lower than expected. And interestingly, the core CPI, which strips out food, energy, and shelter, so affected that as you will, although I hear the Fed is looking at that more closely these days, actually fell five basis points. And that is the first drop since September of 2021. So as you can imagine, we had quite a reaction in the markets where here again, you see silver was down earlier this morning, about 29.45 before the news came out and now back over 30. And as we talked about yesterday on the show, to some degree, I hope this doesn't come as a complete surprise that we've seen a lot of volatility, volatility after silver broke above the 30 level. And indeed, that is what we've had for the past couple of weeks. A lot of technical trading around there, stop orders placed, and either case, uh, if you're one of the people out there upset that we're below the highs of around 32.50, certainly again, remember where we were even just a couple of months ago with $22 silver, certainly a good indication, especially that it has kept popping back up above that $30 mark. And two other silver notes here. This is from Bai Xiaojun over in China, and he mentions after today's close, many people are discussing the outflow of OTC silver and the silver vault fell below 700 tons. There's a bit of a panic spreading. As for the silver vault of the SGE, it hasn't been declared for customs. So here you can see that, and you can find him at Oriental Ghost on Twitter. Fortunately, the site that, I, that used to give me a nice chart of the inventory seems like they've taken that off. I'm searching for another one so you can see how that has evolved over time. Although he mentions here, drop below 700 tons for the first time since 2020. And as that is happening, we did have an update. This was uh, coming from Bloomberg where they reported last Wednesday, China's silver imports hit a three-year high of 390 tons in December, then hit 340 tons in April, well above the monthly five-year average. And as we know, China is certainly at the forefront of the solar panels with a lot of demand going in there, amongst other green and industrial products. Although we will not dig as much into that today. Certainly we've covered that plenty. <clears throat> but a quick look at gold, which is now up 25 bucks, right around noon Eastern time. And again, we'll see how this changes when the Fed gives its statement and then the following press conference, but don't think that we're going to have any rate surprises today. And as you can see in this handy chart, thanks to Craig Emke at tfmetalsreport.com, which great site to sign up to for some daily coverage. See here on Monday, we're looking at a 47.1% chance of a rate cut in November. Now that's up to 47.9% with a 31% chance that we're even 50 basis points lower and perhaps a better thing to even take a look at here. Here is the 45.9% for September, which is now up to 61.7%. And I'm sure it'll be fun parsing through the clues of the statement. 
and how Jerome answers things at his press conference. So quick look at our bond yields, which are down 14 basis points today. So certainly being felt in the bond market and also the dollar market, which is down close to a percent at 104.34. Now, of course, all of this is going to change in the next couple of hours, but at least a look at where we stand heading into the announcement, which for time of this recording will be just in two hours from now. If we take a quick look here at the core CPI index year over year, you can see has come down quite a bit since the hikes went into effect. That's back in October of 2022 at 6.6%. That has leveled off a bit, although beginning to fall a little bit. And again, the latest reading at 3.4%. Keep in mind, a couple of months back, Jerome Powell did mention in one of his comments that rate cuts also could come conceivably as a result of a weakening labor market, which is up from 3.4% last May to 4% now. So already seeing a bit of a jump there. And I would imagine that if there's anything that the Fed statement or Jerome Powell says that could even conceivably be construed as dovish, we could see quite a, an, an extension of the rally in stocks, bonds, and metals. So while we've heard talk in recent months of potential Fed hikes, and of course, a lot of people who are expecting Fed cuts, obviously, I think heading into the meeting, the one thing that we can agree on is which means they need the rate hike and the rate cut. They need a rate hike and a rate cut. Which so means we'll see if the Fed does a hike cut at today's meeting. It seems like we're in that position where that's kind of what the plan calls for. Although some other plans of things that people are calling for, this was another one where we have Senator Mike Lee introducing a bill to call for the abolition of the Federal Reserve System so it would be fun to be watching the, the statement and press conference with Mike. Doesn't seem like he's a fan, as certainly a lot of people that are into the gold and silver community are not. And he mentions how the Fed has overstepped its mandate, failed to control key economic variables like inflation and public debt, and says this legislation aims to protect our economic future by dismantling a system that enables unchecked government spending, monetization of the federal debt that fuels it and widespread economic disruption. Is this likely to pass? I would say not, although <clears throat> things like these add up and it's not just Ron Paul anymore who's calling for that. I think that it does send a significant message and not entirely dissimilar from what we're seeing out of the BRICS what we're seeing out of a lot of state legislation that is repealing taxes in various forms on gold and silver. And of course, this is just a couple of weeks after we had Thomas Massey introduce the and the Fed Federal Reserve Board Abolition Act. And he, of course, mentions the same thing. Americans are suffering, suffering under crippling inflation and the Federal Reserve is to blame. The Fed created trillions of dollars, loaned it to, to the Treasury and monetizing debt is closely coordinated is a closely coordinated effort between the White House, Federal Reserve, Treasury Department, Congress, big banks, and Wall Street. Again, are either of these likely to go through <clears throat> perhaps in our near future? Maybe not, but you put some gold and silver in Costco. You have new congressmen and senators calling for ending the Fed. You have the Federal Reserve itself publishing a paper on a gold standard and whether that would achieve the goal of stabilizing long-term prices, which they came to the conclusion that it would. And a lot of these things are sounding similar to what the BRICS nations have been saying and match the, well, perhaps we're not to the level of matching the actions that the BRICS have taken as we will dig into here because in addition to the Kremlin calling the U.S. an enemy for the first time amidst indications, certainly that Vince has talked a lot about on the morning show and I've talked with Andy Schechten about and other shows here where you see that tension escalating, whether it's Biden giving permission for Ukraine to use U.S. weapons to strike inside Russia and 
regardless of one's particular views on where the boundary between who's right and wrong lies in that one, it certainly seems to not be heading in the right direction right now. And another update we have here is tying back to something that I mentioned a couple of weeks ago. There was a report from Pepe Escobar who was talking about the unit which would be a payment settlement mechanism that is backed by 40% gold and 60% BRICS currencies in its current proposed format. I have been hearing about this for a couple of months, had mentioned it briefly as I just continue to track it. <clears throat> then we got his report a couple of weeks ago. And what I thought was interesting there is that it, at least as reported, taken things from the speculative stage to now it's being reported as being on the BRICS Business Council. And anyway, there's a follow-up report here. The three key messages from St. Petersburg to the global majority. And in the year of the Russian presidency of the BRICS, the St. Petersburg International Economic Forum had to deliver something special, and it did with over 21,000 people representing no less than 139 countries. And there are some particularly interesting highlights here. This one about Putin and talking about how the West launched total economic war against Russia and how in response they have established a solid diversified system oriented towards global trade, which we are seeing happen. And then here you have the key one, bullet point two. And that was arguably the major breakthrough in St. Petersburg that Putin stated that the BRICS are working on their own payment infrastructure. And if we pull up that link, you see here, work on establishing a currency for use within BRICS is ongoing. Russian Deputy Foreign, Foreign Minister Alexander Pankin told Sputnik on Friday, and this is the quote here, the work on moving towards a currency which Russia and BRICS could use for settlement as a reference currency is ongoing. However, the matter of when this common currency will be developed is complicated. And if we come back here, some interesting details that he reports, including Putin had a special meeting with Dilma Rousseff, president of the BRICS New Development Bank. They did talk in detail about the unit that was first revealed exclusively by Sputnik. Well, I was <laughs> excited. I, th I think we mentioned it back then. Uh, and by the way, we do have the guest coming up next Monday, who was the one who I would say really has been tracking this along with Pepe on a certain level and was where these things. So it will be fun to check in with him. And anyway, they did talk in detail about the unit, an apolitical transactional form of cross-border payments anchored in gold, 40%, and BRICS currency, 60%. The day after meeting with Putin, Dilma had an even more crucial meeting with Sergei Glazyev, who is the one that has been most publicly commenting on this for the better part of the last two years since the sanctions and having Russia removed from SWIFT. And again, Sergei Glazyev is the Minister for Macroeconomy and Integration, to be clear, they didn't mention that part, but Glazyev, who has previously, previously provided full academic backing to the unit, explained all the details to President Dilma. A beaming Rousseff revealed that she's already discussed the unit with Putin. It was agreed there will be a special conference in Shanghai on the unit in September. So while Congress in the U.S. is talking about why we should abolish the system here in the West, you see over in the East what is happening. And we will continue to keep an eye on it. It's quite a shift that we see taking place here. Some elements of it a little disconcerting and to the degree I think if this should proceed as it appears that it has been proceeding so far on one hand if you're still if you've been studying gold and silver or watching videos like this for a couple of years or, or longer in many cases then certainly it's quite stunning to see some of these things rolled out also we did have Saudi Arabia join the BIS Project Enbridge as a full participant, which again last week announced that they have reached a minimum viable product stage. Project Enbridge is the result of extensive collaboration back starting back in 2021 between the BIS Innovation Hub, 
the Bank of Thailand, the Central Bank of the United Arab Emirates, who did an oil deal last year with India using rupees instead of dollars, and the Digital Currency, Currency Institute of the People's Bank of China and the Hong Kong Monetary Authority. And now the Saudi Arabia Central Bank is joining Enbridge as a full participant. So these things are happening out there now. And certainly, if you're keeping track of it, I think that has a lot to do with what we've seen in the gold and silver pricing. But one thing, one other thing I did want to pass along, we heard on Twitter and different places last week, last two weeks, perhaps, of the possibility of the U.S. and Saudi Arabia ending a petrodollar contract on June 9th. I have not heard further if there is some clarification, but this was reported U.S. and Saudi Arabia close to finalizing draft security treaty and seems like, at least according to what Reuters is reporting, that that is being extended. Two last quick notes before we wrap up that I just wanted to pass along. Tavi Costa, who hopefully will be able to get on the show soon, did get a chance to meet him a couple of months back and certainly a, a great, great guy and an incredible analyst. So guessing many of you have seen him. And here he points out that family offices currently allocate 1% of assets to commodities. So that's all commodities, which includes gold. And um, I think many of you have heard before how Rick Rule is fond of saying and uh, how you have about half a percent allocation to physical on average. So certainly, if you start getting some American mainstream participation and that changes, another thing that will be affecting the markets in the years going forward. And one other note I wanted to pass along, this was from last week, but the FDIC just reported that 63 banks are on the brink of insolvent collapse. Unrealized losses on available for sale and held to maturity securities soared $39 billion to $570 billion in the first quarter. Surge was driven by higher unrealized losses on residential mortgage-backed securities, a result of the rising mortgage rates in the first quarter. So while there are people who are far more qualified to speak on the dynamics of the banking sector, it does not sound like we have seen the end of that. And although as we do reach the end of today's video, I wanted to thank First Majestic Silver, who brought us today's show. And I did actually check in with them last week. And fortunately, it seems like everything is still on track. They have identified the water source at La Encantada, which was a big reason you've seen the all-in sustaining cost of First Majestic rise again over the past two quarters. Although that is on track, should be, should be bringing the cost of production down quite a bit. And also the fact that you have the silver price where it's been certainly is going to be good to see how the second quarter ends up playing out for First Majestic. So thank you to them for bringing us today's show. I hope you're all doing well out there and have fun watching the Fed today.